Okay, John, we are heading aft over the uh, deck house right now, over the officer's quarters, heading for the grand staircase. All right, this is the grand staircase right here, coming up. And there it is. You're looking right down into the curve of the A deck level. Okay, Mission Control, we are starting bot ops. I'm just backing Gilligan out of his garage right now. His fiber optic tether is starting to pay out. Uh, coming about and okay, ready to roll. We're just about to head down the stairwell now, and we're going to go down actually six decks. Okay, just straight forward, right over the edge. That's it. Okay, got you. This was a beautiful carved oak staircase. It went down. Uh, we're on the boat deck level right now. It went down A deck, B deck, C deck, D deck, and um, down to E deck. This is our kind of main main elevator that we use to get up and down through the ship. It really allows us to get uh, to all the different deck levels uh, on Titanic. So in a way, it's a it's a blessing. The fate of the grand staircase has always been a mystery. The centerpiece of the ship and perhaps Titanic's most opulent feature. Down this staircase, Titanic's wealthiest passengers, members of high society from Europe, America, and Canada, made their grand entrances to the dining room. This was the place to be seen. Titanic's grand staircase was really by far, in my opinion, the most dramatic, uh, exquisite interior feature. Uh, it extended from the boat deck all the way down to F deck. The really elegant part of the staircase uh, went from the boat deck to E deck, that's six decks. And it was made out of pale English oak and beautiful gilded wrought iron uh, and bronze balustrades all the way down. It must have been really spectacular to, to stand at the boat deck and look all the way down to the E deck level there, down all those six decks. Of course, it certainly doesn't look like that today. It's all gone. The fate of the Grand Staircase has always been a mystery. Initially, it was thought that it had collapsed into the heart of the ship, but there's no sign of it. There's still plenty of wood preserved in the wreck, so it's surprising that a structure this solid is no longer there. You see, I think that the whole stairwell just lifted right out, the wooden, the wooden stairs leaving only the foundation. And these girders are just collapsed parts of the dome and so on from, from overhead that fell in when the ship hit the bottom. You'd have so much lift off that much wood and nothing holding it down because it was designed to be held in place, you know, more by gravity than anything. And we just stumbled upon that by accident when we were making the movie. And we sank our set and the staircase broke loose and, and floated up. It actually created a pretty dangerous condition because we were all in the set and suddenly this thing came roaring up underneath us. It was pretty wild. In the meantime, I kind of want to ask Don if um, any of these survivors or any, if there are any reports of the Grand Staircase popping out in one piece. Well, they're not necessarily one piece. Um, Jack Thayer thought that he saw the bow of the ship come up out of the water, which we wonder now if that was maybe the staircase. And one of the survivors was found floating on a piece of staircase and he was picked up by a lifeboat. But he didn't say in his account how big a piece it was. And really, it couldn't have been too huge, I don't think, because it was just him and one other man on it. So um, at least there is some record of what we think is the staircase appearing, but nothing definitive. Interesting. Well, it sure did leave a big hole, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Now, John, we've just come over to the port side of the ship. Um, I'm actually flying Elwood, and Mike's got Gilligan. We're on the port boat deck, and this is a winch, which would have been used to raise the lifeboats, pull them back on board after a lifeboat drill, but uh, they didn't use this winch. That winch was never used. And here's the uh, deck house, and you can see the windows. Some of them still have the glass. Incredible. Look at that. These were first-class cabins here. I'm going to move in on this window so you can see the glass. And if we look around here to our left, we'll see the broad expanse of Titanic's boat deck. There it is, going all the way off forward to the bridge. We called it the boat deck because this is where the, the lifeboats were. 
And of course, during the sinking, this was the scene of uh, a lot of the action during the night. Amazing. Now, what you would have seen here is the davits for the lifeboats. They would have been standing up about 12 feet tall. The boats are about 30 feet long. There were four of them along here. And people would have been standing around not knowing what to do. If we, uh, if we were to look up, we'd see the number one funnel, the big smokestack, and steam would be venting out of that because they, would, they were venting off the steam from the boilers because they were at full speed when they hit the iceberg. Yeah, and so now the officer is trying to tell people, get in the boats. You know, they, they can't understand them over the, over the steam. You've got the ship's orchestra playing. They're right down here on the other, on the other end. They're hearing ragtime music. You know, it's light and perky. So there's this strange mixture of, of a thinly veiled hysteria with this almost surreal sense of calm. And as the, as the passengers came out, they were mustered on deck by the officers and they were told to, um, to get into the lifeboats. Ladies, ladies uh, first, women and children first. And they didn't want to go. And I'll show you why come over here to the edge and look down and this is what they would have seen just blackness now ladies and gentlemen we are going to begin boarding the lifeboats for the time being QM I require only women and the ship was six stories above the water it was a moonless night and it just looked cold and black and desolate out there and it was so warm and uh, and comforting here on the ship. If I just turn around here, current. So really what it was is, is a sense of denial at this stage. They were in a, in a state of denial. Right over here is where we had uh, lifeboat six. Lifeboat six would have hung here in its davit. You know, the thing that's incredible about, about boat six, right where we are right now, is that there were so many people involved in the history of that night uh, on boat six. Well, lifeboat six is really one of the most interesting lifeboats for the different characters that it had in it. You had Frederick Fleet, who was the first man to see the iceberg, the lookout. Iceberg, right ahead! You had Robert Hitchens, who was the quartermaster at the helm at the time of the collision. And then, of course, the unsinkable Molly Brown, this Denver millionaires who was made famous by the sinking of the Titanic for the way she took charge of the lifeboat once it was out on the water. Um, Major Arthur Pushin from Toronto, who came climbing down the falls when he was ordered into the lifeboat at the last minute because they needed the extra hand. And he's just a few days short of his 63rd birthday, and he does that. Um, you've got a number of really strong women. You've got the daughter of a congressman from West Virginia. You've got several militant suffragettes from England. Uh, the daughter of the man who founded this department store, Saks Fifth Avenue. And they really got into a big fight with Hitchens once they're out on the water because he didn't want to rescue anybody from the water. He didn't want to go back to the ship and get more people. And even though they never ended up doing any of those things, these women really sort of kind of took charge of the lifeboat under Molly Brown's direction before the night was over. <laughs> that is pretty incredible. There's a, there's a piece of the actual rope that was used to lower the lifeboats. And right over here, yeah, it's a bit. They use that to you know, tie the ropes around to feed them out so that the boats wouldn't you know, go crashing down to the, uh, to the water. Boats were launched by hand. There's guys on ropes, old school. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to head aft. And we're going to see the spot where the ship's band was playing. So this is, we're now, now going along where boat eight would have been. Boat eight would be just over here to the right. And actually boat eight was kind of cool too. There was the, the Countess of Roths. And she was, uh, you know, kind of a, kind of a foxy, cool royal who, uh, who took over the, the tiller of the boat. There's a, the remains of its davit right there. The, the only davit left um, uh, aft on the deck here and it's knocked down, obviously, by you know tremendous forces when the ship was sinking, stuff being torn off by cables and rigging, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going right over the dab. You got a good view of the dab right now. Look at that. So this is where they would have played. I mean, this is on my first dive to Titanic in 1995. We landed here, and I was struck just by the 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 surreal nature of the fact that I was sitting here on this deck of this famous ship that it seemed like a legend to me 
and it wasn't a legend anymore. It was a real place. It was a real place where real people had had died, where a real tragic event had taken place. And something about looking out at the at the deck at this rusty deck that barely looks like anything, and knowing that that's right where the Titanic band had played, it just had a, a huge effect on me. One of the unique aspects of the sinking is the fact that the orchestra, the, the ship's band, came out on deck and played all throughout the sinking. Um, you never hear of that happening in any sort of disaster of any kind, the heroism of musicians keeping people calm and playing ragtime and later quietly beautiful selections. Um, there's a controversy that at the end they played Nearer My God to these, some people play, say that they played Song Da Tum, another piece. Uh, I believe they played Nearer My God to Thee, but the British version, because so many British people claim that they heard Nearer My God to Thee, and Hartley, the band leader, Wallace Hartley, even told someone once that if you're on a sinking ship, that would be the piece that he would play. So I absolutely believe that that was what he did. Every one of them was lost in the end, and they did find Wallace Hartley's body later. And when they returned it to his home in England, more people attended his funeral than actually lived in the town. The, the public was so caught up with that story. We're on the boat deck level. This is really interesting what's right in front of us. Here's, here's another electric boat winch, just like the one on the other side. It's got a railing collapse down over it. There was a guy on board, Colonel Archibald Gracie, and he tells a really amazing story of survival. He's one of these, there are three or four people who are our kind of black box recorders for what, what it was like in the last minutes of Titanic to be standing on her deck as the, as the, the water kind of came up and, and just washed them away. And his story is pretty dramatic. He was on this deck and people came screaming and running aft. And as the, as the ship started to plunge, the water came racing back across the deck. And he said it picked him up like a wave at the beach. And he, he reached up and he grabbed up the, the top of the deck house, right, right where we're looking, right here. And this railing down below us was up on top of the, the deck house. It's fallen down. But he grabbed this railing and he held on to it. And, and he forgot to let go. And it actually, you know, he was so freaked out by the moment that it pulled him underwater. And it actually dragged him down. And then he said he, he felt, he felt this huge suction drawing him down and he was underwater for an endless time. And probably what that was is, is all of the, the, the water pouring down like a waterfall inside this, this grand staircase and like a, like a, you know, toilet bowl of the gods. And somehow he, he made it to the surface and he, he managed to make it to the, to collapsible B. That's a, a an overturned lifeboat and he survived and this, this is right where that happened. Yeah, and of course, so many people didn't survive, but he's one of the few that did. And it seems like everybody that did survive who was actually aboard, uh, who wasn't out in a, in a safe in a lifeboat someplace, had an incredible story to tell.